Good morning, everybody. This originally started out as a project to speak to the third grade class about vocations, and now I understand that it's gonna go out to everyone. And so I've been kind of asked to share my story about my journey to the priesthood and when it all began and when did I first realize that I wanted to be a priest. So I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, it didn't happen overnight. It's not as if I woke up one morning and said, I'm gonna be a priest. It was a process, really, of many, many years. I started out going to St. Paul Catholic Church, which is in downtown Lexington. And as a student, I served masses. And so I, we were part of the community. My parents were very involved in the community. My dad ran the St. Vincent de Paul store, which was an actual store on Main Street. He managed it, but my parents were very involved in the life of the parish. And growing up with a large family, we went to Mass every Sunday. We went to Mass every Holy Day of Obligation. We attended every chili supper, every school play. It was just a huge part of my life. I can say that even as a child, I do remember that I was just, I was very prayerful. I liked to pray, and so we, I, I prayed the rosary on my own and with the family, and I had my own prayers that I would say on a daily basis. And when I was growing up, and keep in mind, I'm 60 years old, so we're going back 50 odd years. <clears throat> the priest was always someone who was very, very distant. You, you didn't get real close to him, and he was kind of a mystery, and he was a little scary. But when I was in the seventh and eighth grade at St. Paul, another priest came into my life by the name of Father Charles McDonald, and I credit him with being a big reason why I explored the priesthood. He was the first priest I ever saw as both priest and human. And so I'll give you an example. I was on the boy, in the boys' choir with Father McDonald. He was a very accomplished musician. He was a great organ player, great piano player. He loved music. And at that particular point, my voice hasn't changed as, as, as deep as it is today. So I was able to sing higher parts. And I had, a, he thought, a pretty good voice. So I was part of a, a boys' choir. But what he would do, is uh, he showed me the difference between there was work and there was recreation. So as a priest, he would often take me to nursing homes. And, and before we, we would go in to visit a particular patient, he would say, now Danny, I just wanna give you a heads up. This particular person is this gender, this age, they're blind. So when they're speaking to you, they might want to reach out and hold your hand or reach their hand up and touch your face. Don't be afraid. And that's how I learned to do it. And then after we worked, he would take us bowling. So we would go, we would spend the afternoon with recreation and bowling. And one of the other things he did that it still has had a, such a profound impact on my life is he would take me and a couple of other students from St. Paul to Eastern Kentucky over weekends to serve masses, which is probably something I could not do in this day and age, but felt very safe and very secure. And it was it had a huge impact on my life. To this day, I still have a photo album of all the pictures taken when I was in Eastern Kentucky. And he would coach us along because there was this one particular church <clears throat> that in order to get to, we had to park and then walk two miles uh, and through the mountains to this little, church that had a potbelly stove in the middle of it and he would tell us the servers he because the mass was changing at this time and we were incorporating the sign of peace and so he would say now when you offer each other the sign of peace don't be afraid to go down to the congregation and shake their hands so i learned just by observing him and watching him I thought he's kind of the priest I would like to become, someone who was involved, not someone who was distant or who was uh, not approachable. And so I learned a great deal from Father Charles McDonald, and I credit him to this day for my desire to want to study the priesthood. Like everybody else, I went, finished high school, grade school, graduated from high school, went to college, and when I was about 24 years old, 25, 
after I graduated from college, we were still part of the Diocese of Covington, and I went to explore the possibility with a vocation director with Covington about my desire to be a priest. I actually kind of started to get the feeling that I wanted to be a priest around 16 years of age. And so I knew I wanted to be in some form of religious life. So after high school and college, and I was working in retail management for a couple of years, I still felt the push to want to be a priest. So I went and spoke to the vocation director at the Diocese of Covington, and the meeting went very, very well. And as I was driving back home, I thought, I can't do it. I thought, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not perfect enough. I'll have nothing to offer. My siblings said, Danny, you can't be a priest, you can't sing. And I thought, well, I hope there's more to being a priest than just the ability, ability to sing. And so I just couldn't do it, and I backed out of the process. And so over the next few years, I continued to work in retail management. And by the time I got to be 31 years of age, we were no longer a part of the Diocese of Covington. We were now the Diocese of Lexington. And a number of factors had converged to want me to explore the priesthood again. One, we were our own diocese. I was a little older, a little more mature. I was completely out of debt. I did not know anyone in this world a penny. I was also completely unemployed. And I thought, I have absolutely nothing to lose. So I decided to go through the process of studying for the priesthood again. So I spoke to my vocation director, spoke to Bishop Williams. I went through the whole process. And I was one of 12 men who went through the process in 1991. I was the only one who got accepted. And so in the fall of 1991, I was accepted to study for the priesthood for the Diocese of Lexington. And I went to St. Meinrad, which is a Benedictine monastery in Southern Indiana to begin my studies. Within a few weeks, I realized I had made a horrible mistake. I was absolutely miserable and I didn't care who knew it. I was just not happy. I thought this cannot be what God wants for me. How could I have missed all the, misread all the signs. And so with a great deal of humility and embarrassment in the, fall, in the spring of 1992, I had to move back with my mom and my dad. I had no money, I had no job. At that particular point, I went on and got my master's degree in library and information science with my depth of study being children's literature and library management and then I continued to work as a library director. And I actually happened to be at Eastern State Hospital, which is the state mental health facility in Kentucky. And as I was working as a library director, a number of the patients asked me out of the clear blue if I was a minister. And I said, well, no, I'm your library director. And they said, but you're, you, you conduct yourself <laughs> like a minister. The feelings just would not go away. And after I worked as a library director for a couple of years, I thought, I can't fight it anymore. The desire is still there. And so I spoke to my uh, spiritual director again and my vocation director again around December 31st of 1996. And they said, I'm hearing that you still want to be a priest. And I said, I do. And so I had to go through the whole process, the whole application process all over again, because I had been out of seminary formation for five years. Again, I got accepted. And so I can remember going to mass on New Year's Eve in 1996 and telling my mom and dad, I wanted to try to be a priest again. They were very, very supportive, very loving, they never forced the issue. They said, Danny, we just want you to be happy with whatever you're doing. We don't want you to feel any pressure in any way, shape, or form. It has to be your decision. And so in the fall of 1997, I attended a different seminary in Wisconsin, which was called the Sacred Heart School of Theology, which is basically a seminary for second career vocations because I was 37 years old at the time. 
And I can honestly tell you, the day I got there, it was August of 1997. It was a very rainy day. It was an eight-hour journey from Lexington to Milwaukee, where the seminary was. And so I went into the chapel to offer up a prayer of thanksgiving. And as you walk into the chapel, if you look in a straight line, there would be the baptismal font, and then directly behind the baptismal font, you would see the altar. Behind the altar, there were the presider's chairs. Behind the, uh, the presider's chair is a little elevated. You see the tabernacle. And then right behind the tabernacle in the center was this beautiful stained glass picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And so I dipped my hand into the baptismal font to make the sign of the cross to thank God for a safe journey. The most overwhelming sense of peace came to me. And I realized that I had gotten it right when God wanted it to be right. And that 37 years of age was the time for me to enter seminary. And then four years later, I was ordained a priest. And in these past 19 years, I can honestly tell you, not one regret. I have loved every minute of it. Has it always been easy? No. Have there been difficult, stressful times? Of course. But that's true of any vocation. But at the end of the day, there is a foundation, a deep peace within me and contentment that I know that this is what I am called to do. And I love it. I will tell you that as I was over those 25 years, because it took me from the time when I was 16, when I first realized I could have a, a call uh, to the priestly vocation, to the time I was ordained at 41 years of age, uh, I had a lot of time to self-reflect, and I had a lot of time to ask myself, what could I bring to the priesthood? And I can tell you, it's not always easy. I thought, I'm not holy enough. I can't sing. Suppose I don't have all the answers. What's going to happen because I'm not perfect? You know, suppose I don't know what to do in a given situation. And I've shared with people that I have a morbid fear of public speaking. And I thought, suppose I get up there and I stammer all over myself, or I start stuttering, or I miss words. What will happen? I thought, you know, and I really struggled with this because I thought, you're not perfect enough. And then I came to realize, and so many people helped me to see, God's not calling perfect people. He can call very ordinary people and will give that person the grace to do what he or she needs to do when he or she needs to do it. Fortunately, over the years, I have become more comfortable, although it's never completely easy for me. And if I do make a mistake, I'll make a joke, and when people laugh, that calms me down immediately, and we can just go on. And people have thanked me over the years for the ability to give them, they tell me that I give them the, the, the like permission to be human because they see me as human, which is probably one of the nicest things a priest can ever, re a compliment a priest can receive. I am human. I struggle each and every day. I can be selfish, I can be impatient, I get angry, I can get cranky, I can get moody. Uh, there are days it's not always easy, and some days I think I just want to be alone. I just want to read. I want to stay at the rectory and just drink hot tea and read my murder mystery and not be bothered with anyone. So it's, uh, it's learning to accept that a priest is human. Just as we all are, we have our strengths, our weaknesses, our good points, our bad points. But at the end of the day, everyone has a vocation, and we're all doing what we can to promote the message of our Lord and Savior. I happen to do it as a priest, but it takes all of us working together to make this message work. And his message was really one of love and acceptance. It's not about always being right. It's not about being perfect. It's not about having all the answers. Sometimes it's just trusting that he's with us and that he will give us what we need when we need it. And so I'm not sure if I'm an answer the question to the vocation. It was a long process, didn't happen overnight. Mom and dad did not push me to be a priest. They just wanted me with all my siblings to be happy 
and to live a decent, honest, moral life. For me, the journey to the priesthood was a series of starts and stops and starts and stops and starts. That's just the way it went. And it finally worked out, I think, when it was supposed to work out. I am very grateful for the priests who have shown me so much about what it means to serve, what it means to be humble, what it means to be human, and what it means to have a sense of humor, which I think is so important in any vocation, but very important within the priestly vocation. The ability to laugh, not take it all so seriously, and just to be present to people. Because one of the greatest burdens and the greatest blessings about being a priest is you get to be present with people at some very, very, very difficult times in their lives and just be present to them. And also you're present to them in very joyful, very celebratory occasions in their lives as well. So it, it's, I, it's both the tears and the laughter, the sadness and the joy. And that's part of the vocation of priesthood. And it's something that I have come to appreciate and respect and for which I'm very, very grateful that people have taken me into their lives and that I've been able to share what they go through and just be present to them. And believe it or not, it's not all one-sided. I learn from other people every day. It's not just about me as a priest teaching other people. Other people teach me daily about what it means to love and what it means to accept and what it means to respect one another. So I learn from other people probably much more than people that are learning from me. It's a relationship. So we learn from each other. So basically, that is my journey to the priesthood. It didn't happen overnight. I'm glad I kept trying. I'm glad God did not give up on me. And I'm glad for all the support that I have been given. And I can only hope and pray that when all is said and done, and I can stand before the throne of God and give an account of my life, that I will be able to demonstrate that while I was on this earth in word and action, I try to the best of my ability to promote the message of his son, a message of love and light and hope. And if I can do that, then I am confident that my life and my ministry will have been a success. So thank you all very much. That's basically the story. Um, so. God bless. See you soon. Take care. Love you all. Bye.